Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Today's guest is David Kuhn, leader of the Green Party and MLA for Fredericton South. Mr. Kuhn is a rookie of sorts. He set some history when New Brunswick elected its first Green MLA. Three years into it, we wanted to learn what's it been like? What are the trials and tribulations? Where are the exciting parts? And can you take us to the inside on how legislatures work? What's it like being an MLA and working in your constituency? If you like our show, please click the Patreon icon in the top right corner. And now, here's Mr. Kuhn. So, in doing my homework and prep to chat with you, some people are saying, why don't you ask David why he got into politics in the first place? So, you're three years in as an MLA. Yeah. You've got some mileage under your belt now. Um, do. do you have memories and inklings of that energy that inspired you to do this in the first place? Well, sure I do. You know, there are, there are a couple of things. Um, one was that uh, my sense in terms of making positive change for New Brunswick, that there needed to be uh, new voices in the legislature. In other words, voices coming from the political realm talking about um, positive change that um, we weren't hearing and uh, telling different stories than we were hearing. And related to that was the fact that so much of what was being discussed in the political realm uh, that was sort of emerging through the media was seemed to me quite disconnected from the concerns, uh, the, the hopes, the dreams, the issues that uh, New Brunswickers talk about. Um, so. So I thought, well, maybe this is a, a way to uh, help contribute to, to uh, per, per following a, a bit of a new path, to bring some positive changes to New Brunswick. And the other thing was, uh, I was quite despondent over how badly politics was broken in our province. Um, our, the seat of our democracy uh, hasn't been functioning like it should for some time, the Legislative Assembly. Government has, um, compared to say 20 years ago, not been nearly as responsive to citizens as they once were. Um, so in the past, there was a sense that you know if citizens organized effectively, if they felt poorly served on a particular issue or whatever, and the citizens organized, um, and uh, it was an issue that uh, touched uh, a lot of people. And that was made visible to to the government uh, that, in fact, that would have some impact on uh, their decision making and their thinking. Those days seem to be gone. So uh, again, I felt that uh, maybe I could make a positive contribution, being inside the legislative assembly, um, to speak to those issues that um, uh, weren't being spoken about there. Hmm. Following that theme. Um, the notion of, let's say in the next election, all five parties managed to get at least one person into the legislature. There are many who would say that would make it dysfunctional, but you're pointing out that it's already somewhat dysfunctional. So can you map out how uh, more diversity in the voices and the positions in the legislature, how you think that's going to improve the conversation, maybe reconnect back with people? Sure. So. Um this next election is going to be very close between the, the Liberals and the Conservatives. Um, so the chance of, well, so I'll take this example, if I were re-elected and went back with uh, two or three, uh, four other Greens, then we would hold the balance of power. Uh, or if we took your scenario, um, if those, uh, the other members who got elected from other parties uh, cooperated together, uh, on a common uh, agenda, uh, then that group could hold the balance of power. Hmm. My view is we can't afford, New Brunswick can't afford another majority government. Majority governments are not serving us well any longer. Uh, and with a minority government, the opportunity to actually uh, bring some positive change to the province to get us out of the mud, there's a sense that uh, people feel like we're stuck, out, uh, stuck in the mud, that we're we're missing the boat as in, t in terms of where much of the uh, rest of the world is going, and um, we need some 
new well not, not we need to apply the new ideas that are emerging <laughs> everywhere um, there's plenty of great ideas around the province um, and outside the province but they're not being applied we're not pursuing them we're still trying to do the same old same old that uh, hasn't worked well for the province for some years now two themes want to pop up on the diversity in the legislature um, one is does BC serve as an example in a way because of what they went through in their recent uh, provincial election and two that um, most of Canada's progressive legislation federally has come during minority governments so maybe beat a little bit about um, how a minority government can actually be progressive because the common myth is it's going to stifle, you can't get anything decided. So, so, so the teamwork, people don't see behind the scenes very much yeah. about how much you work as a team sometimes. Yeah, so BC yeah. is an example. Um, I guess the point here is that one of the reasons the Legislative Assembly is not working um, is that over multiple governments now, um, the authority of the Legislative Assembly has been usurped by the Premier's office, the uh, center of government. And so the Legislative Assembly is not really the seat of our democracy anymore. It's kind of like going through the motions. Hmm. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. One, uh, it's the legislative branch that's supposed to hold the uh, executive branch, the Premier and Cabinet, accountable. That's where the checks and balances are built into our system of democracy. But that's premised on the fact that, or the idea that uh, MLAs on the government side feel free to vote um, on, behalf, on behalf of their representatives, uh, uh, their, their constituents, constituents yeah. uh, 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 according to their conscience, depending on what the issue is, um, uh, rather than simply always towing the government's line. On, a, on an issue. That's necessary for those checks and balances to work in our uh, Legislative Assembly in the Westminster system of democracy. As it does in the United Kingdom, it still functions that way in the original Parliament. We've lost that and so those checks and balances are not being applied. With a minority government, um, it would force uh, that to occur because the governing the, 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 the party that would form the minority government uh, would not have the ability to just do what it wanted from the exec, from the premier and cabinet side of things. It would actually have to uh, participate in the uh, work of the legislative assembly uh, to move issues forward that uh, perhaps would better represent the interests of New Brunswickers uh, mm -hmm. given the diversity of voices that would be brought to bear inside the legislature. Um, and that will be a key difference in that scenario. Um, so that's that's a, a, a big change. The other one is um, the, our committee system. So th the way in our system of democracy that between elections most citizens should be able to interact with their MLAs is through our legislative committees. It should be the case that citizens have the opportunity to come before committees and comment on a bill um, that they're interested in or have concerns about or comment on a policy or what have you. Um, but our committee system is not organized any longer to do that in New Brunswick. It's, that's the way it works in Parliament in Ottawa, the House of Commons Committee, the Senate has committees. Um, but here that's not functioning. In fact, uh, at the committee where we delve into the details of proposed laws, the bills, I made a motion a year ago that we reserve the right to call, uh, we call them witnesses officially in parliamentary parlance, but mm -hmm. um, citizens or uh, expert with, uh, experts on particular issues. And my motion was ruled out of order, it wasn't even debated or discussed and voted upon. So that's how bad it is. And remember, we're talking about the seat of our democracy, we're talking about our fundamental institution mm. uh, of democracy and it's it's dysfunctional right now mm. the um, as you map that out for us and thank you the uh, it sounds like the difference is um, being in power and governance and there's there's more of a push to I want to be in power I was elected to make these decisions I'm going to go make them no matter what compared to governance which has more interaction with citizens and, well, and their I, inclusion in the process so that uh, yeah I Sometimes that collective wisdom of society is good, and other times the collective wisdom needs some direction or guidance. And you've lost some balance there somewhere. 
I think that's fair because in our system, in fact, we're electing um, a House of Assembly. We're electing representatives uh, to the Legislative Assembly and then um, the party that has the most seats uh, forms the government or whichever party can get the confidence of the House, if it's a minority situation, forms the government. So we actually don't vote for a premier. Uh, like they do uh, for president of the United States, and um, it's tempting to make a joke about that, but I'm not going to. Anyway, uh, you know, so we vote for our ML MLAs, and uh, as long as the 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 the, the, um, uh, the, the, the government has the uh, governing party has the confidence of the House, then they continue to to uh, govern. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's what's happened as the power of uh, the Legislative Assembly to, to basically oversee what um, the, the government, the party in power is doing, is, has been sapped away into uh, essentially the party in power in the, in, the, in, the, in the role of the Premier and the Cabinet, particularly the Premier's office. Uh, then our, um, the health of our democracy, the capacity of our democracy to function for people to serve New Brunswickers has been severely undermined. Hmm. Any thoughts about um, people who are not elected that actually have a lot of influence on our Premier's office? Well, absolutely. I mean, so, so one of the counterbalances to that, of course, is the committee system where in the media, in the public, open to everybody to see, and in the world, you know, the era of social media, it would be widely accessible mm -hmm. when people come and speak before a committee on an issue or a proposed bill or law or, or a, a policy. Um, and I, I always remember the story um, exactly to this point where Louis uh, Robichaud, when he was premier, um, had, uh, you know, Casey Irving was lobbying about all kinds of things, against all kinds of things that Louis Robichaud and his government were trying to do um, to, to um, make things better for New Brunswickers, to uh, make things more equal for New Brunswickers, to tackle poverty, to diversify the economy, uh, to bring equality for uh, uh, Acadians in, in New Brunswick. So uh, he said no. <clears throat> Mr. Irving's going to have to appear at a committee and and uh, and say his piece in a legislative committee. So that's what happened. Casey Irving appeared at a committee for all to see, to see what he was talking about, what he was arguing. So so it, it put it out there, made it transparent, so people could see, in fact, what specifically what kind of pressure the premier was under and the government was under, uh, to and the legislature was under to uh, to change the course that they had been pursuing. So that's, uh, I think, a, a great tale to, to underline the importance of doing that. We've got to return to that kind of transparency so that you don't get uh, the, as much lobbying uh, and pressure behind closed doors. Uh, and you know, even to the extent of, of, of uh, job blackmail where, where uh, a firm uh, can say, well, you know, if we don't, if you don't go do this or, or go this way or, or support whatever mm -hmm. that we're looking for, then we're just going to have to shut down our plant or we're going to take it somewhere else. Um, so you want to make as much of that, you know, as much as possible, all of that visible. The committee system allows you to do that if it's functioning properly. And then, uh, and then on the other side, the, the citizens and, and, and experts on matters of, that, are, that, that we need expertise as well uh, uh, also becomes visible to everyone and transparent. So it enriches our, our democracy and makes our democracy really work uh, more effectively. Because if we don't know uh, uh, what the issues are, um, and, and, and are able to see the various sides of a, an issue, a policy, a proposed law, uh, and then it just gets rammed through. Okay. So the original question was, um, going into politics for the first time, you're three years into it now, do you have uh, thoughts about your journey uh, from what you thought it was going to be like to what you now know completely, like you're immersed in the process? And it, is, do you still feel like David? Um, do you still oh, yeah. have, have that, uh, that fire to go in and do with those things? From the outside, people will go, oh, someone becomes a politician, and they win, and they change. Yeah. So sp speak to that, because you haven't changed. You know? Yeah, I think, um, so the one thing is, you know, you, you're, you're on all the time. 
mm. which I hadn't really quite thought about uh, before. <laughs> Talk so, about pressure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, <laughs> you're on all the time. And so in your, in your constituency in particular, um, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're not kind of thinking inside your head as you're walking along down <laughs> Queen Street or King Street or whatever, uh, because people will think, well, you, you know, you're ignoring them or you're being rude or whatever. You didn't, and so, uh, you know, if you're kind of sleepy in the morning, you're not, you're not, you got to be on. So uh, that, that was kind of interesting. Um, the, uh, the other thing is... Um, I didn't, and this was sort of new to me, was I didn't really um, expect the amount of work uh, as an MLA that one does to help your constituents navigate the system. Like uh, in my office, myself and Taon, who's the constituency coordinator, we do a lot of work that I would assumed government departments would be taken care of, um, but when uh, when uh, citizens run up against sort of bureaucratic hurdles in some way or another, um, they turn to us and, and to me, and, and so uh, myself and Taeyeon, because we're a team, uh, help to solve those problems. Uh, as advocates, uh, as champions, sometimes it's just providing information about how to navigate. Mm. Um, so that, you know, that was has been interesting, and we've learned a lot. So in, in many ways, um, the, the office kind of does some social work type activities. Um, so we've built a, a really great network with all the amazing people working on the ground in the field, um, in, in, in the sort of the helping fields in Fredericton, mm. uh, so that we can help send people here, send people there, bring someone in um, to uh, help people out in their, in their own personal struggles. Do you see a way of that? Um it sounds like you've coped and adapted. Do you see a way it could be planned out better so that rookie MLAs, when taking on the role of representing their constituents, has a slightly better infrastructure or team or a process in place to let them feel like they're helping the people better rather than they have to scramble a bit and figure out how this all comes yeah. together? Yeah, there's not much, there's really no sort of training for MLAs. Um, this is very basic orientation at the beginning uh, for new MLAs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th that would be helpful. Um, so you had three or four staff instead of well, like one. That's what I was going to say. A little better budget would be helpful as well. Um, MLA's budgets uh, for the constituencies are far smaller than the MP's budget. And uh, so, in fact, I don't think there's an MLA around who can afford to pay staff a uh, uh, full-time salary for the entire week. Uh, there's just not enough uh, money in the MLA budget to do that. So that means the uh, you know the time available for helping people is is uh, reduced. Well, of course, you're always as an MLA, MLA you're always, you know I'm always available, but but uh, without staff support, it, it takes longer and becomes more difficult to do things. So. So that's uh, critical. Um, and, and I think the other thing is, you know, how, how, how do MLAs be good representatives, which gets back to what I was saying earlier. If we, if we move towards the kind of uh, legislative assembly that, that it should be in terms of serving New Brunswickers well, um, MLAs need to look at how they can be... Um, do their best to represent the interests of their constituents. So you need to figure out ways of doing that. Um, so, you know, I do neighborhood meetings twice a year in each, each neighborhood of the, pro, in, of the city, or at least the south side of the city where the riding is. Um, I've set up a couple of round tables specifically, seniors and a youth round table, so that I can better um, be a voice for seniors and youth in the legislative assembly. And those, I mean, I could set up more but and it would be great, but again, it's, it's sort of time, um, and uh, and maybe after the next election, if I'm uh, fortunate enough to be reelected, then look at uh, adding to that. Um, so you know, I, I I try and be present at as many places as I can to understand, you know, for at events and meetings and so on to understand what the particular issues are. So mm. so there's all kinds of ways of of. Uh, of uh, hearing from the constituents, getting a sense of where people are, and also communicating back out and trying to be as transparent as possible to your constituents. So anyways, that, that's a whole area that I'm hoping will 
uh, improve for everyone. Um, I was pleased that my motion to uh, establish a job description for MLAs was finally uh, voted and adopted um, by the Legislative Assembly because I thought that actually would help individual members if there was a specific job description that lays out in black and white attached to the rules of our of the house how um you know what your roles what your responsibilities are how you should conduct yourself um that that would be helpful and maybe help individual mlas to argue with the backroom guys well yep. it says here what was you know why, why can't i do that yep. so um that's uh, hopefully going to get developed um it'll go to one of the working committees to get developed in the in the next uh, sitting great um, it's funny to think that an MLA didn't have a job description. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. In fact, last election when I was recruiting candidates, uh, someone who ended up deciding to run uh, said that she had done some research and couldn't find the job description. So she was saying, what's really involved? Yeah. There's nothing. She said, I couldn't believe there was nothing written down. The Legislative Assembly mm -hmm. website, nothing. Anywhere she could find. So it was uh, that got me thinking. And other jurisdictions have done this. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, Australia, I think uh, some of the n territories in the north of Canada. So there's two things you've brought to our attention. Um, one, there's no job description for MLAs, but because of your motion, there's one in the works. And two, when you become an MLA, the orientation or training is, is sort of on the light side. And some of it you have to kind of make up as you go. Those two things help, help people understand what it's like from the inside. Yeah. As soon as you're elected, they make this assumption. And then they expect everything to start to run, not knowing the pieces and parts needed to make it run. And not even really knowing how our Westminster system of parliamentary democracy is supposed to function. Hmm. Like, how is it actually supposed to work? Hmm. You know, I made a motion, uh, um, a particular kind of motion, at, at a third reading of the bill that was designed, that I felt was going to interfere with the, uh, the uh, independence, administrative independence of judges to determine, uh, you know, where judges they appoint live and so on. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the official opposition, were, when I made it, were going, can he do that? I could hear them saying, can he do that? And of course, I, I, the clerks are there to help all of us equally, and so, you know, they had provided that advice for me about what the tools were available. And uh, so, so I used that particular tool in third reading to, to basically call a halt to it so that there could be some sober second thought around that bill. Um, unfortunately, the government didn't utilize the extra time to think soberly about it. But, so it came back again as a, <coughs> another bill, but without being changed and ended up getting passed. Um, but uh, so, you know, just how we're supposed to operate and how that our, our system is supposed to function, there isn't a great primer on that. Mm. You know, I, um, I've done a fair amount of work myself to try and understand that. I've met... Uh, uh, with a former clerk, actually, uh, to uh, try and understand, just just in a, a kind of informal atmosphere, to um, you know, pose all kinds of questions about how it's supposed to work. What's this? What's this mean? What, can I do this? Can I do? This? So, you know, I, I took that uh, initiative on my own to do that. But you would think that there would be a good sort of primer provided to everyone when you get elected. Is this is how our world works? Yeah, yeah. it's a um, MLA for dummies. They show a cover. You know? <laughs> Probably shouldn't call it that. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, they take a lot of information, shrink it yes. down into 200 yeah. pages and exactly. get you started. Yeah. Well, so, so actually, <laughs> because uh, most people now don't have a good sense of how it's supposed to work either, how are we going to bring change if citizens themselves don't uh, re realize how it's all That's supposed it. to function now? So in, in my office, we put together some videos um, on that called uh, Legicate Yourself. Um, so um, we had some amazing social work students for their social action placement do that and it kind of came from them a little bit they said well after they've been working in my legislative office for a while they said okay like we didn't know about how this all worked and now we're starting to see and we think other people would benefit from learning this and I said so we said well let's do that let's just kind of come up with an approach that you guys think will be um, uh, comprehensible and understandable by people and and so yeah so we put, they put together these three uh, educate yourselves uh, videos and they're great I've shown them in classrooms and uh, I've got to do more to promote them to uh, to teachers uh, and I've watched them you know see the rea the, the reaction of the uh, the class and it's it's been great yeah. yeah, they yep. just it's they're they're done. They're kind of funny. They they've got the, the information 
the details, but in a in a kind of lighthearted way, and and they're working. Good. That's that's great to know. Um, when we put the show up on social media, we'll put the link in. That'd be great. Yeah, so we can find that. Um, let's change tack a little bit and uh, want to talk about some key issues that are hot right now in yeah. the legislature. Um, because fall's coming pretty soon. This is mid-August, late late August. Um, okay, but August is not over yet. I just want to no. say that while we're taping this. <laughs> True enough. Um, pipeline may resurface, may not surface. Um, the mine, system mine stuff. Um, the, the taxation issue and the mechanics. Um, aside from the details, let's play with the taxation one. Aside from the details, the issue of process. Um, it seemed like there was a gap that emerged. Uh, mainstream media didn't dive into the gap too deep but about who decided this, like yeah. the authority of who puts this stuff forward. And then the, we were pretty well versed uh, on the consequences of how it rolled out and then fell apart a bit. Um, which ties maybe back to your committee process and decision-making process. Maybe not. But. Well, it does some because what we saw there was where the role of a cabinet minister um, uh, should have been to be on top of what was going on and should have known what had been happening in there. Um, the cabinet minister in question never spoke to it publicly um, and seemed like a number of cabinet ministers be playing more of a ceremonial role as a minister. That's not the case for all ministers, but in some uh, departments that does seem to be the case. Um, and so uh, that's worrisome because uh, if the minister is not on top of his portfolio, mm. uh, then the system starts to break down. Mm. And uh, then you've got you know, the minister out of the picture and deputy ministers working with their staff and the staff of the premier's office and, you know, so where's the accountability in that? Mm. The minister is the elected person um, and is accountable to, you know, New Brunswickers. So uh, that, uh, yeah, there is a big breakdown there. But, but broadly, you know, on taxation, I think there's a sense that it's not fair that um, we need to take a real detailed look and the whole taxation system in the province to ensure that it's fair, so that everyone is paying their fair share. No one is being, um, you know, paying an, an unfair burden. One of the things that's happened over time, and not just in New Brunswick, is the proportion of income tax um, being paid by uh, households compared to businesses has shifted. Um, so proportionally, businesses are paying less than they did. Uh, years ago, and households are paying more than they did years ago. And I think people generally see that as uh, being unfair, that there needs to be a better a rebalancing occur. Um, so one of the things I talked about is the need to have an inquiry into uh, our tax system of taxation, to look at property taxes, to look at income taxes, to look at the whole ballywick, um, so that we get beyond this simplistic uh, you know, back and forth between the official opposition taxes are bad and the, the government saying, you know, well, we've got to do these for good reasons. And, yeah. well, taxes is not a four-letter word. It's actually a three-letter word. Um, and, and they're essential, of course, to enable us to, to run hospitals and schools and universities and yeah. repair the roads and all of that. Uh, so uh, it has to be organized fairly, though. Uh, and people have to have, have, have a sense of uh, fairness and that people aren't uh, avoiding taxes either uh, that they should be paying. So I think that would be quite positive. You know, again, we, in the past, in our system, we, we uh, utilized inquiries um, quite commonly to bring these issues to the fore and engage uh, engage New Brunswickers in the discussion and try and come up with um, a resolution that uh, does a good job of uh, well serving the population. And uh, it was common, I mean, if you go back to Robichaud days, that was a common tool that uh, that he used and that legislature used. Um, and Hatfield, too, used it fairly frequency, frequently. But uh, since that time, probably the last inquiry that was really done was um, maybe not quite right. I guess the last one was probably under Lord, Bernard Lord, maybe into, into um, car insurance. Hmm. Yeah. 
One of the common narratives tying to taxation is that for New Brunswick to be competitive, we need to lower the corporate tax rate. Mm -hmm. Anytime I do homework on that theme, I find New Brunswick's always the middle of the pack. Yeah. It, it's, it, and our electricity rates are often cited as a detriment to doing business here. And when I do homework on that, I find we're in the middle of the pack or the bottom third of the pack, meaning yeah. we're doing quite well. Well, in fact, uh, up until last year, last time I saw a report from the Conference Board of Canada, our net business tax um, was the lowest in the country, tied with uh, maybe one other province. Um, and that's that's when I say um, uh, business tax. I meant all the taxes that yes. the business is paying, not just the. Well, the, the Conference Board of corporate. Canada report was was wonderful. New Brunswick comes up looking like a great place to live because it is a great place to live, but it's not part of our narrative. It's and, not well, politically. It's not part of our narrative. It's not. And one of the fascinating findings of that report, and I got a, 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 a friend of mine who's an economics prof to crunch some of the numbers, so I had the actual data. Um, the equality. Uh, in New Brunswick, income equality I'm talking about now yeah. is um, pretty good yeah. compared to, uh, say, British Columbia or, or Toronto, uh, where income the disparity between incomes is quite dramatic, and uh, and that results in all kinds of yes. uh, negative consequences. Uh, here we don't have that, uh, and that's a positive thing. In fact, um, and when you look at any rankings of sort of life satisfaction. Nationally, New Brunswick comes out quite high as well. Yes. So we're we're you know we we're quite happy um, on balance. That's not to say, of course, we've got serious problems to address, and then we've got significant poverty. And that Conference Board of Canada report actually identified the three things where we really needed to work on. Yep. One was poverty. Yep. Two was uh, mental health. Uh, based on the rate of suicides, which are very high in New Brunswick, and three is the high rate of youth unemployment. Yes. Well, so there are three <laughs> things that we should tackle. Yeah. Now, are those are those three things uh, a, a priority of uh, government currently? Uh, not really. Youth unemployment is something uh, government has been working has been working on. I've got a number of programs targeted at that. Uh, the other two, not so much. So one of the narratives that we could be developing better in the provinces is, is the positive side of it. And we use politics a lot of times as our celebrity. Um, we don't have movie stars per se or right. sports heroes per se. So politics is, uh, politicians are used often as the, the celebrity or the front page of the paper the most frequently mm -hmm. um, compared to, you know, if it was Los Angeles or you'd be competing for airspace big time. <laughs> um, so in that political sphere, the way that conversation unfolds, it tends to be quite adversarial or um, conflict-based. Mm -hmm. Is there a window for shifting that narrative into like more of a complementarity? Um, there was a time on Peter Zowski's program with Camp Cairns and Lewis. Yeah. The three of them would really carve out their turf, but they were always responsible for speaking to the whole. Like yeah. They always loved Canada. Yeah. Um, New Brunswick's an amazing place, and the more we do the show, the more we learn the stories of so many people doing so many incredible things. Yeah. That we hope that it builds that narrative over time. Here's the place where you can find all the positive stuff. It'd be fascinating to do the same thing in the political sphere. And people generally want uh, the parties in the legislature to work together like that. The big surprise for me when I got elected was how partisan things are. I mean, it's far worse than from a distance even that they look. Uh, you know, the old line parties are very, very tribal. They, they really are. Um, and partisanship is uh, extreme. Now, I wouldn't say that in the, in, in the case of every member yes. uh, or even member, every member of cabinet at all. Uh, but as, as sort of a institution, as institutions, they are. Um, so that's, that's a big barrier because I naively uh, thought going in there that there would be more collaboration or more opportunity that it would be possible to create informal caucuses uh, on issues that people would share in common and, and uh, as the committee system is not working so well we could kind of create temporarily I mean, something in parallel where we could all attend and invite people to come in to talk about issues that are important and anyway but the, the atmosphere didn't, doesn't really lend itself to that uh, there. And, um, you know, you, I, I guess the, where I got my wake-up call was when I brought in um, 
the Local Food Security Act, or the bill that was going to create an act um, to focus on building the local food economy in New Brunswick. Um, initially, the government told me they would support the bill, and I thought, oh, great, that's cooperation. And you know, it was a, it was kind of an enabling bill. It wasn't, a, it wasn't prescribing too much. Particularly, it was set up a, a way of engaging everyone to set targets for growing the local food economy and to discuss how we go about doing that in terms of a strategy and so on. It was an enabling bill. Um, but uh, the day that it came for second reading, the minister told me they were going to vote it down. Well, why? Why, why would, why don't, if there's some problem, just amend it. Like, what's the problem here? And uh, it was widely supported. There was lots of excitement around the province uh, about the bill. And as I said, it wasn't prescriptive, so it wasn't really locking uh, the government into prescriptive things other than there should be a you know a target for what percentage of our food should be coming from local sources in the future and some date. Yeah. Um, and uh, that we should set some specific targets for our hospitals and things like that. So beyond that, it was not, you know, the, the, it, there was nothing pr prescribed particularly in it. Um, so uh, they could have amended it if there was a problem particularly that they saw, but chose not to and defeated it. So that said to me, you know, and, and I had been, I had been submitting um, dra my bills and draft ahead of time um, to all the parties to, so they could see it, so they'd be prepared when they came forward. And, yep. um, but that, for the most part, didn't seem to make too much difference. Now, there was one exception, which was the... Uh, uh, my bill uh, to ensure that all students in the public school system learn about uh, the realities of Indigenous people and First Nations in New Brunswick, both contemporary and historical, about their, our relationship as is determined by the treaties, uh, about the, the um, residential school uh, catastrophe and so on. Um, and uh, I introduced it twice and on the second time it passed um, with the help of uh, a champion within the cabinet uh, who, who really helped ensure that all his folks uh, were agreeable to supporting it uh, and the official opposition as well uh, supported it. So it was unanimously passed in the end. So that was a great example of what is possible. Mm -hmm. it, it sort of was an example of the potential that exists there. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was great. It was a great moment and you know we all at the end, we, we uh, so the, the, initial, the idea for the bill came from David Purley originally um, from the uh, Wallistic Wig Mi'kmaq Institute at the uh, Department of Education at UMB, he and Imelda. So they were there in the, in the gallery and so afterwards, you know, myself and uh, the uh, Minister of Education and the Critic for Education from the official opposition, we all got together with them and got pictures taken. Great, you know, it's a cooperative effort. Yep. That's what people want to see more of. Yep, yep. The... Uh so let's slide into some hot issues, uh, glyphosate B1, um, maybe the future of some industries um, and, and where maybe New Brunswick needs to change. Um, implicit in all of the political discussions are, here's the vision for how the province needs to unfold for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, when Blaine Higgs sat in your chair during an interview, he talked um, with much enthusiasm about systems change. We need to change how we make some decisions. We need to be a bit more inclusive. Um, couldn't get any specifics, um, which is fine because maybe a systems change doesn't have a specific till it services and then you approach it a different way. Um, but it's clear his vision of, of where to go and yours is going to be quite different for mm -hmm. how to get there. Food security being your classic. Um, why that doesn't have traction is a mystery. Um, you'd think a population would want to be able to know how to feed itself. Yes, exactly. So, so can you walk through, if you pick glyphosate or one or two others, um, forecast the next uh, sitting of the legislature um, and pros and cons and things that you would like to see um, unfold? Well, on glyphosate, um, we're still stuck as a, you know the government is in the same defensive position it has taken historically governments have taken historically over the years on pesticide spraying whether it was uh, the insecticides being sprayed uh, during the spruce budworm infestation uh, whether it was the use of agent orange under power lines um, or more broadly in new brunswick in fact on that one uh, I remember on Ontario uh, banned its use, um, Ontario Hydro 
had extra drums of it, and they sold them to New Brunswick. So, cost saving uh, histor <laughs> historically, we've been the last ones to finally say, yes, this is a problem when it comes to the aerial spraying of pesticides, widespread sort of that kind of large, broad application of pesticides. I mean, they're toxic chemicals. So, I mean, when you think about it, just intuitively, the idea of intentionally releasing uh, large volumes of toxic chemicals from the air into, yep. uh, you know, onto the province. Yep. Uh, from should, water systems to soil systems. Should raise systems. all kinds of warning signs. But, so we've, we've been, that defensive posture has always been there. And it's, it's happened again with glyphosate. That the, the routine with pesticides has always been, they get approved, they're regulated. Uh, the government, uh, our government stands by, and industry stands by and says, we, we, you know, we'll go by what the federal government says, what the regulatory agencies say until they say something different. In spite of mounting evidence, you know, uh, to the contrary, until the evidence becomes so overwhelming that it can't be ignored to the point where the consequences are starting to represent violations of environmental or fisheries laws or uh, in the province. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or clearly are, are manifesting themselves in, 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 in obvious health mm -hmm. problems, mm -hmm. then action is taken. Um, but by then the problem so, is compounded. Well, exactly. So, so your costs exactly. are much greater than if you had yeah. dealt with it at root. I mean, it's a crazy system because the way pesticides are regulated, uh, the companies who, who come up with them and are man going to manufacture them, they're responsible for t having all the testing done. And then they submit the tests. Mm. They're not required to, if those tests uncover any problems, those results don't go to the regulator. Yeah. They don't see them. Yeah. So the problems start to be seen after use, mm. after years. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and that's been the pattern. So here we are with glyphosate. <laughs> and the same pattern is being repeated itself. Quebec got rid of it years ago. Mm. Mm. Um, are they able to show any benefits for getting rid of it? And still maintaining the industry's needs for whatever purpose they wanted to apply it. So were their needs satisfied with another product, and at the same time the environmental impact was um, m minimized? Well, um, so I think a couple of things. In Quebec, they they haven't gone down the same forest management rabbit hole that we have, which has been yeah. very much to... Um, uh, re clear cut and, and, and replace the natural forest with a plantation yeah. uh, rather than natural regeneration, which is very strong here. Trees grow back. Um, and depending on how you cut determines what trees come back. Uh, so there are ways, you know, so, so, so if you manage the forest that way, then you wouldn't spray. But when you have plantations, because, because when you clear cut the hardwoods, want to regrow so vigorously to kind of um, create that shade and, and, and increase the humidity and kind of heal yep. this wound that's been created by the, by the clear cut, um, they, they try and come in like gangbusters uh, into these um, plantations of black spruce or, or uh, uh, jack pine or what have you. And so that's why they spray. So that doesn't. So they kill. So they get killed off to or, or allow the softwoods to grow. So um, here, uh, it would require a shift back to uh, less clear cutting, more selective cutting, uh, and um, more use of natural regeneration, even in clear cuts, uh, where you would thin the natural regeneration to favor those species that that are commercially desirable, rather than plantations. And rather than using glyphosate. So, well, so they go together. If you have plantations, you're going to have glyphosate or some other herbicide. So that's the connection. That's the solution then. Because Quebec came up with another solution. So yeah. it sounded like they had different approaches to forest management other than chemical spraying. So, if, yeah. But if in New Brunswick, if you're going to have plantation forestry, you're going to have glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So it goes hand in hand. And that's one of the reasons that uh, particularly... Uh, companies like JDI, who are so invested in uh, the plantation approach to forestry, uh, don't want to see uh, a glyphosate ban mm. um, because that change that would necessarily change 
that approach. The, the, and they're quite invested in plantation forestry because it was kind of it was the vision of K. C. Irving, so the father and the grandfather. Yeah. So it's not just kind of the economic system here, but there's there's sort of some personal family investment in not uh, diverting yeah. from that path. In my opinion, that's yes. the way I see it. That's good. In, in um, context to that, a guest on the show in the past was Ken Hardy, the late Ken Hardy. At that time, general manager of the NB Federation of Woodlot Owners, right. it was two weeks after the Crown Lands strategy decision had been rolled out, and Ken gave us a lovely New Brunswick Forestry 101 explanation about um, uh, the use of small woodlots and buying from different supply, and and right. there was a potential solution there that wasn't used because we couldn't be creative in our thinking. Um, and you've just mapped out another example of we need to be a bit more creative in our thinking mm. for solutions. Um, another topic or area that you see that's it's coming? Um, well, I mean, so... Pick one. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Education, uh, health care... One of the things that, that I hear from constituents about uh, um, is the long wait times in our emergency mm -hmm. departments. There was a piece in a paper just the other day about some lady waiting 12 years to get onto a... You know, family doctor list so that she could get a referral to see a GP or a C specialist. So yeah, so the sort of broad area of access to health care, there's some big barriers, whether it's waiting in the ER, waiting for a family a doctor or a health care provider, because you know, there's nurse practitioners, so I have a nurse practitioner, not a family doctor, mm -hmm. who's great. Um, whether it's uh, trying to access mental health care, um, you have, or whether it's trying to access as, as a senior uh, nursing care, if you if you need that kind of care, uh, there are long waiting lists in all those cases, waiting times in all those cases, and um, we're not grappling with it. Hmm. It's it's kind of bread and butter issues for for so many New Brunswickers, um, and we're not grappling with it. The solutions don't seem that challenging. But um, there doesn't seem to be the political will, will to implement them. I've, you know, on, on wait times in um, the emergency rooms, I've talked to the uh, chief of the ER at the Chalmers, at the Moncton Hospital, and, um, you know, and learned from them. And they've been proposing solutions, of course, but it's not kind of gotten up and implemented. So, uh, and, and, and the wait times, it's not just frustrating and, and you know all of that but it's dangerous uh, because as they told me uh, patient safety is at risk there, there's a there's an element of the of the patients in those ER rooms who uh, whose safety is at risk because of the wait times they there are targets they're supposed to hit uh, for the amount of time that, that category of patient has to wait and they're missing them by five six seven times um, so that's a, a, a serious problem and needs to be grappled with. But so far, I don't know why the health minister is so resistant to this, because I've been banging away at this in the Legislative Assembly, question period after question period, and I, I, I'm getting like I'm getting no traction. And clearly, I know the, the ER, ER docs from around the province have been kind of in their world push, trying to push, push forward solutions, and it's just not budging. So uh, the same goes for access to mental health care. Uh, we spoke earlier about the, uh, New Brunswick having the highest rate of suicides in Canada, um, which, you know, could be a, a symptom or, or a consequence, I should say, of, of our, uh, our poor mental health care system. And those that are working in it are doing great work and are trying to do the best they can, but they have such limited resources. Mm -hmm. The waiting lists are so long to get to a psychiatrist or to get to a child psychiatrist or, or to access psychotherapy, very difficult. Uh, so, and, and, well, anyway, that's a big story, a big, big issue, but so, that, so that's a, a, another one. The same with nursing homes. You know, we've got people uh, languishing in hospitals who should be get ex, you know, getting into nursing homes, having to live in hospitals, which is not any place anyone wants to spend a lot of time in. Mm -hmm. So uh, none of these things seem to be taking on the sense of urgency that New Brunswickers feel they should. Uh, and um, but I'll continue to work on those. And and clearly, if if uh, as uh, Green MLAs we hold the balance of power after the next election, this will be one of the key um, um, elements that will or, or, or demands that we will expect for for our cooperation to support a minority government to 
to finally resolve those access to health care issues that are so important to people. We have about five minutes left. Ah. And that would be a, a good bridge, actually, to slide specifically into the Green Party and the work coming in the next year. Right. And uh, so people will know uh, where you're going and how you're going to get there. Um, do you want to share, um, uh, is there an early strategy starting to emerge? Much like you just shared, we're going to focus here and here. Um, do, you, do you have um, building plans? To just give us a peek into what's humming behind the scenes for, for the party. Sure. Because you're breaking the turf. You know, sure. You're a returning MLA, um, and you created a little bit of history three years ago, and your team created some history three years ago. So it's a unique position to be the sophomore. Yeah. Um, coming back again, and, and it's quite exciting in lots of ways because it's a new voice in, in the mix. It's very exciting. And so this summer I've been spending a lot of time traveling the province, um, meeting with people, uh, uh, meeting with people who want to organize at the local level, potential candidates, um, trying to understand what the particular issues are in, in, the, in the different regions of our province. Uh, by uh, by talking to people and being present and uh, so that's been quite helpful and also all part of that process leading up to the next election um, and you know I mean it's, it's always amazing when you travel around the province how warm <laughs> our people are in every region it's a beautiful place and uh, and of course the natural beauty of it and the interesting things people are doing um, or, or trying to do and so that's exciting. Well, both uh, you know, social enterprises, nonprofit organizations, business enterprises, cooperatives, um, farmers, and and uh, and uh, fishermen. I mean, it's just really quite exciting to see all these things that are going on. So, um, so that's that's clearly one thing. This time around, uh, that's different from last is there is a record for people to look at mm -hmm. of having a green MLA working in a constituency, in the Fredericton South in my case, uh, of a Green, ML Green MLA working in the Legislative Assembly, and, as, and of a Green Party leader working in the Legislative Assembly. So there's a record there to, to uh, present and for people to see uh, around the issues that I've championed, the, the proposals I brought forward to, for solutions to important challenges. We've got the, the proposed uh, laws I brought forward, the policy ideas I've been uh, presenting, um, uh, the issues I've brought to the floor. And uh, so one of, the, one of the challenges in the context of the next election is making that visible uh, to people outside of Fredericton, because, uh, you know, in Fredericton, people, you know, it's easier to sort of pay attention. And we, uh, I'm around a lot. People have a better sense in, in Fredericton about what I've been doing, and that should be the case since I'm their MLA. But uh, when you get outside of Fredericton, it's not the same. So there, there is a, a challenge to meet there to make that um, visible to people so that you get the same response that I get when I go give a speech or, 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 or uh, meet, to a, a meet, meet with a group, they will say afterwards, we had no idea those were the issues the Green Party was championing or that that's what the Green Party is about, um, that you're community driven, for example, um, that, that you see that, that more authority and power needs to be vested at the local level. So how do we bring more decision ba making back to our local areas around our schools, around our health system, and around uh, uh, um, our, our, the important matters in our community. So, so that's that's something I'm working on. Um, the thought of uh, how to get the forty percent who typically don't vote to vote. Well, uh, I guess I'm and, and my colleagues are in a privileged position in a way there because um, certainly what I find is uh, with strong green candidates. Um, where green candidates have won their seats here, in my case, in uh, Prince Edward Island, in uh, Peter Bevang Baker's case, or in British Columbia, uh, people have come out in droves. Many people have given up voting, come out to vote, because they feel like they've got um, someone and something to vote for that's exciting, that's hopeful, that's um, positive, and uh, that represents a fundamental change. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, it, it speaks to what's being offered, I think, to, to citizens to vote for. Um, and uh, I, people are, in a sense, voting with their feet, not showing up at the ballot box. Uh, and that should be sending a strong message to all of us 
and look at that and, and, and why. And I don't know why it's dismissed so much by the, some of the other parties, but um, it, it, it really is. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like an artist um, uh, letting a painting of theirs go to a public, to an auction of, uh, of just sort of regular people, not to sort of art connoisseurs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be, <laughs> it can be quite, yeah. quite uh, telling in a way, humbling. Uh, so, you know, it, it should suggest that there's something fundamentally wrong here that we need to uh, be addressing and, and certainly as Greens, that's what we're trying to do. Final thoughts to send us out? Well, I think, you know, uh, overall social media is an amazing thing uh, that we have that it's helping to enhance democracy, has tremendous potential, still just starting to tap it. Um, and uh, and your show is, is is all part of that to air issues so people can listen to different views and and uh, in a in a in a manner that's not constrained by a couple of minutes soundbite or whatever um, that uh, I've been trying to do the same thing to try and uh, make what I'm doing as visible as possible so you know I've got davidkuhnmla.ca which is uh, a website. Uh, that's not a partisan website, it just reflects what I'm doing in the Legislative Assembly and in the community. I mean, there's the Green Party website, which is the partisan website, um, but this is a separate one. Um, and I've, I've, you know, mirrored that in a Facebook and, uh, page and in a, in a YouTube channel. So, so um, I've been trying to, to make those things as visible as possible for people so they get a sense uh, of what I've been doing so people can access that wherever they are and uh, and make a, an informed decision coming the next election. Thank you for this. Thanks very much. It's a great conversation. Yeah, great chatting. Thank you for watching. If you like the show and want to support it, click the Patreon link in the upper right corner. We'd love it if you'd share the show and make some comments on the Facebook page. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.